So please join me in welcoming Chris Holm. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Mountain unicycling. Uh, it's, it's a sport that really, you know, not a lot of people know about. <laughs> I'll be, let's be frank. Uh, but it's something that has shaped my life in many ways, including some that I would have never really expected over the last 27 years of riding. Um, but first, I wanted to ask, um, just, and I'd love to see some hands, how many people have heard of mountain unicycling? That's incredible. You know, you couldn't give yourself a hand. I mean, that's amazing that you can. But this is what you see, I would say, most of the time. It's, it's, it's funny. It's a bit, a bit of a shift in stereotype. You see the stuff you see on videos, yet it's far more diverse of a sport than that. There's kids that ride, there's older adults, there's families that go on rides together, there's uh, experts, beginners, elite athletes, weekend warriors that get out and ride on these things, uh, however unlikely it might seem from the outside. There's every riding style that you can imagine, the same spectrum as cycling, from street riders to flatland riders, freestyle, distance riders, uh, Casual riders, um, it's the best way you could possibly walk a dog on leash. Um, and uh, there's every style of mountain unicycling as well, from free ride to downhill to cross country. And, and I wanted to just introduce you to a few of those different kinds tonight. I got started as a unicyclist as a 12 year old. Uh, I grew up in Victoria. I often did kind of oddball sports, stilt walking, pogo sticking. I saw a street performer playing a violin on a unicycle. I played the violin, so I don't know why, but I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I got into it. And I came from an outdoorsy family. We did a lot of hiking, um, skiing. So it just seemed natural to take it off-road. And I, I was into climbing a lot, and I'd take it on climbing road trips around North America. In a lot of ways, it was just kind of a hook. It was a reason, an excuse, in a way, to, to get outside and explore different places in the outdoors. Something simple, something that stripped away the technology and let me experience something much more directly than I felt I could do otherwise. I moved to Vancouver in uh, 1998, discovered the North Shore, and things kind of took off from there. And I got some sponsorship support, became a professional writer, and got a chance to travel to some places like here in Bhutan to make films. Um, and combine my love of travel and adventure with, with riding. And, and it was a time period in the sport that was kind of like mountain biking in the 70s or climbing in the 60s. There's this whole ocean of opportunities out there. Um, basically, anything you do was first. And, and there was no precedence here uh, riding across lava that had solidified one week before I got there. Uh, and, and this was just a big experiment. There was, there was nothing out there to tell you what you could do. Some of it was a, a mental challenge too, a focus, putting yourself, for me, I was curious about what happens when you put yourself somewhere where you just can't screw up. And, uh, and, uh, and so there's that aspect too. Um, I was interested, because I like to go mountaineering, uh, it turns out that mountain unicycles are incredibly packable. You just stick it on the side of a snowboard pack and you can go places that you'd never choose to. Volcanoes are a great unicycling objective because they're kind of non-technical. As a mountaineering objective, they're hard to bike. This is down uh, in uh, Mexico, riding on El Pico de Arizaba. It's about a 5,000 meter high volcano. And we tried to ride down the south face. Uh, we didn't know <laughs> what it was going to be like before we got there. It was really fast, and it really worked. And go figure, right? You never know until you try. Um, there's also the urban environment. Um, same thing, an urban environment becomes a playground. And you can get out there and you can try stuff, some of which is a little scarier than others. That's the broad bridge. Um, but, 
It's all an experiment, and sometimes it's, it's in most of the time, honestly, it's a lot less scary than that. And you're doing something that's technical where it is okay to fall, and you're down on the ground, and, and you're just basically just trying stuff. It's a big jungle gym. Um, <laughs> and with that comes kind of a sea change in perspective. Um, I don't care who the person is, even if they're an elite athlete, usually when you try to start on a unicycle, you can't even go a meter, you know? And then you try it a bit more, and it starts to become kind of doable, and then pretty easy. It's just like a bike uh, when you get into it. And then humbling, as you realize that it's, there's this whole spectrum out there that you can do all over anywhere, um, and it's limited basically only by your imagination. So the sport started growing. It went from obscurity in the 1990s to today something that's done off-road by many tens of thousands of riders around the world. And it's become something that is like a microcosm within the larger sport of mountain biking uh, that, that you'd, never, you'd, you'd never imagine. Now, one of the most popular riding styles is cross country. I got the opportunity to ride some cross country a couple years ago competing against 500 bike riders in the BC bike race. I signed up for the challenge division and essentially I trained as hard as I could and I rode my heart out uh, and it was intimidating but the highlight for me came on day five when on a 43 kilometer leg I ended up standing on the podium in third place uh, ahead of about 200 mountain bikers across all the categories. And that's where I thought, you know, this has got to be the most underestimated riding style in the entire world. You know, it's like a secret. Um, but at the same time, it's a mountain unicycle. Why? Really, is the question I get the most often. Why would you make things so hard for yourself? And yet, if you think about it, does a mountain biker want an engine on their bike? Is a snowboarder, did they forget their other ski? I mean, what about trail runners? They don't even have any wheels. And so that's part of the point. It's the point. It's, it's a very human objective to place obstacles in our path. And I think, too, to strip away to the essentials. And, and so we can connect more directly to the ground on which we're riding or what we're doing. And so for me, it's become kind of a symbol for simplicity, for focus, for doing something new, for experimenting, trying things. And ultimately, and most importantly, I think, for knowing that Things, hard things, are worth it, and they do require persistence. And with that persistence, if you have it and you push through, you know, the sky's the limit, uh, really, in terms of what you can do. It's limited only by your imagination. Thank you. Uh -oh. um, Chris, you mentioned it tonight, and myself included. Actually, before I ask this question, just a show of hands. Who here has, has actually been up on one of these before? A few. There's a few, okay. Awesome. So the question I have is, is the perception that many of us might have is that, you know, uni, it's impossible, it's mm -hmm. very hard. Um, and you said tonight, and I've, I've heard you speak before, that you know, when people try it, it it's actually doable. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose the question is, how, how has your involvement in the sport of unicycling changed or maybe challenged some of your own perceptions just in life in general? I think that... In, in a couple of ways. Um, one is that persistence really is the key. That it's not brilliance or, or some talent that it's kind of bloody mindedness and just doing something over and over and over and over until you, you get it. Uh, and, and the other one is, is more personal and that because I have chosen to explore sides of the sport which have some risk attached to them, uh, it's kind of a nice thing to realize that, you know, if you're doing other stuff, at least you're not going to die physically if you don't make it. Really? Right? And, <laughs> and, and, and it's kind of comforting when you have put yourself in a position where you might. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, Weirdo. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Let's hear it for Chris Holm. Thanks.